most of the, actually the entirety of the rest of the conference is filled with uh, hard technical content. Um, this is the opportunity that I take every year uh, to talk a little bit about the less technical side of Green Radio, uh, like how the community is doing, how the project's doing, stuff that's happening. Um, try to give everybody a, a general sense of where we're at and where we're headed. Uh, so every year I, I have a stats slide first. Um, if you've seen them in the past, I usually show traffic to uh, the websites and blogs and, and, and hits on the Git repository and that sort of thing. Um, a little bit different this year. So uh, if you remember, if anybody saw my presentation last year, it, I, talked about, I talked a little bit about how what we had seen in the Gunner Radio, what we had seen in the Gunner Radio community leading up to 2017 was, uh, whereas early on the Gunner Radio core runtime, the core distribution, saw a tremendous, um, tremendous activity, and most of the people that were active in Gunner Radio were active in the core distribution. And as Gunner Radio became more mature, uh, and to be expected, most of the actual development activity moved outside of the core of the project. Right? Most people who were working on GNU Radio were not working, were not GNU Radio developers. They were users of GNU Radio developing applications, like GR Satnogs, for example, um, which was awesome. Like, that's how we build community and a great ecosystem. Uh, but at the same time, uh, GNU Radio will be old enough to vote and eligible for the draft next year. Uh, so it's pretty important that we start paying attention to the core again. Uh, so that, that was kind of a major topic of my talk last year, and I'm happy to say that, I don't know if anybody listened to me, uh, but something happened and it worked. So the executed CLA numbers, uh, oh, by the way, I, I have a habit of asking people to raise their hands. Um, who knows what a CLA is? Okay, that's, most of you are lying. Um, okay. <laughs> Uh, CLA is contributor license agreement. If you, uh, Gunner Radio is copyrighted by the Free Software Foundation. If you want to contribute code to Gunner Radio, you must sign, you must assign copyright to them. So an executed CLA means that somebody has signed a contract assigning copyright of all their contributions to Gunner Radio, thus allowing us to merge it. A CLA could be a single individual or it could be an entire company, like analog devices. Um, so we went from five CLAs in 2017 to 11 in 2018, which is huge because uh, getting uh, corporate lawyers to agree to assign all of the rights of IP they developed to a free software foundation is difficult. Um, we had 68 closed issues, and we more than doubled that, and our closed pull requests are up by more than 100. So we've really seen an explosion of activity. Uh, and just to be clear, this is all in the core Gunner Radio repository. This is not in any out of tree modules. It's not in any sub modules like Volk or SigMF. This is happening in the core of the project. Um, so, despite the fact we have we have a non GitHub repository, um, it's at CGit Gunner Radio. Uh, GitHub happens to be how most people interact with us, so it often provides the most accurate numbers. Um, we're right now hovering at about between 800 and 850 unique cloners per two weeks. So that means every two weeks, around 800-ish people are different people are pulling GNU Radio. Um, this doesn't accurately reflect the install base, though, because most, many people, for example, if you're using Debian or Ubuntu, are using Maitland's packages, right? Those get, those get downloaded thousands of times. Um, so these are people who are just pulling the source code. Um, and then this is 2,500 unique, 2,400 unique visitors just to the repository alone. So we've, we've seen a pretty dramatic spike uh, within the core of the project in the last year. Uh, just to review our software coding programs, so every year, we, every year since 2012, we've done Google Summer of Code. Uh, we usually do the European Space Agency's Summer of Code program as well. We didn't do it this year. Um, not to give them a hard time, but they make it extremely difficult <laughs> to participate. But uh, we did Google Summer of Code this year. We had two projects, um, Swapnil, who completely over, overhauled GR ModTool, um, includes a GUI, programmatic control, an API, YAML generators, it's now 3.8 compliant. Um, that's all been merged, which is fantastic. Uh, and Luca, who did a bunch of fantastic MIMO work. So if you're doing any MIMO work, and this has all been merged now, um, implemented diversity combining, Alamudi, differential block codes, 
Uh, lots of really interesting work. And most of that's been merged. I think there's just a little bit outstanding there. Uh, and I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Martin or Felix, uh, we have a poster for Luca's work, but not for swap mills. Is that right? Right. So in the poster session that I'll be running during the week, uh, you can see some more details on the, the MIMO work that Luca did. All right. So this is my opportunity to rant at you guys a little bit again. Um, you guys might remember the slide from last year where I talked about how I lost sleep over the solvency of the Gun Radio Foundation, uh, worried about driving everything into debt, paying for a quarter million dollar conference, uh, and most of you did not register until the week before. And I begged you, I said, please, please, I need you to register earlier because I'm going to go crazy. So this is the week before GRCon 17 where we received 70 registrations. And this is not where it ended. Uh, we had people register Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday including Matt Edis. <laughs> Matt. This is this year. Notice that number is now 140. And we're still getting registrations. Please, please register earlier. Are you taking a picture of this? Thank you, Thank you Marcus. All right. Um, but no, this is, GRCon's been a great success this year. It's been much cheaper to run this year, as you might expect. Las Vegas is much more affordable than San Diego. Um, so I'm not signing quarter million dollar checks to put this on. Um, all right, GRCon 19. We are way out ahead of schedule right now, thanks to our organizing committee. Uh, GRCon 19 will be in Huntsville, Alabama, the week of September 16th. So the venue is a couple of venues still in rotation here. We hope to organize committees to lock down one pretty quickly. Um, it's being co-chaired, by the way, the organizers by Michelle Thompson and Steve Conklin. Um, so this is a picture of Huntsville. I don't know if you can see. That's the uh, you can see a staged rocket right there. It's the U.S. Space and Rocket Center. I realize that nobody except the people looking at the center screen since can see my laser pointer. But you guys at the edges, if you look really closely, you can see a rocket above the tree line. Um, we're really looking forward to going to Huntsville next year. So put in your calendars and start planning out. What? Is registration, open? registration is not open. I also raised that problem. Well, we don't know, we don't know the prices yet is the, is the primary holdup on registration. So we've had some major changes in Gun Radio. Uh, Jonathan Corgan, who's been active in the project for a long time, has stepped down as the Gun Radio maintainer, uh, as well as the CTO of the foundation. And he has moved on to doing mostly other things. He's still teaching classes um, occasionally and providing a little bit of technical guidance where needed. Um, but he's largely away from his role now. Um, so I took this opportunity to sort of change the way the core leadership of the project functioned. Uh, if anybody remembered the way things were working previously, we kind of had a Linux kernel-ish model. Um, where, not the ranting and yelling at people part, but the uh, <laughs> part where like portions of the code base that were organized by directory were owned by technical experts of that area, right? So we had a concept of like um, the, all the analog blocks would be owned by somebody who's an expert in analog and all the digital blocks would be owned by somebody, that, that kind of thing. Um, we've done away with that entirely. Uh, and with the exception of a few, a few very like key roles, like we need to know who the system administrator is, uh, we need to know who has keys to the website infrastructure. Um, we've done away with that role-specific design and have something a little bit more fluid now. Uh, so this is the current leadership. Uh, there's 11. And what we've done is, you can see some role-specific items here, like Volk Maintainer, Nathan, our DevOps admin, Andre. Um, and with the exception of those, everyone who has an officer title uh, effectively has core leadership authority within the project to do mostly whatever, whatever they want. And they can move around and do what's needed to keep the project moving forward. Um, I don't know that this is a big part of uh, the huge bump in activity, but hopefully it's helped. Uh, you notice at the top, uh, there's two foundation officers, myself and Martin. We are the only ones with well, 
technically we have a fiduciary duty, but given that there's no foundation uh, stakeholders other than us, we have a fiduciary duty to ourselves. Um, really, this just means that we have the legal responsibilities of, of maintaining the foundation. Uh, no one else has to deal with all the legal stuff and are just focused on keeping Goon Radio awesome. So uh, last year, I finished this presentation and asked if anybody had questions, and Sylvain, where are you? No, you're over there. You immediately asked, what's the status of 3.8? And I ducked. Uh, so I think this year it's going really, has the merge happened? Let's talk about that tomorrow. It's imminent, okay, it's imminent. The answer is it's imminent. So uh, 3.8 release we've been talking about for years now, maybe two, two well, we're planning, planning on it for like four years, yeah. We've really been ha talking about it for the last two years. Um, it's a really significant move for the project. Um, we're actually moving, everything's moved to Python 3, um, which needed to be done since in 18, 13 months. Support for Python 2 is officially gone, is that right? Or is it another year after that? It's 2020, I think. It's something like that. Anyways, they're gonna stop supporting it entirely. So it was pretty important that we, you know, got to Python 3. Um, there's a bunch of other updates. Uh, YAML is far more prevalent. Uh, lots of updates to the GUI system. Uh, things are just better and more modern. Um, so this has been years of development and we're finally approaching a major release. Uh, so Marcus is gonna deep dive on a lot of those technical topics in his update tomorrow. So I'm not gonna talk too much about that. But I just wanna say that this is a really huge accomplishment. It represents thousands of hours of development time and if uh, they were paid for their work, many millions of dollars of investment. Um, so if you see a core developer, please, please thank them. Um, this, is, this is really significant. So uh, I usually talk a lot of, I usually use this presentation to talk a lot about what's happening in the ecosystem and give examples of neat new out of tree modules and people breaking satellite downlinks and all doing all kinds of interesting stuff. Um, most of the presentation actually is gonna talk about something else, but I do want to talk a little bit about what's going on in the ecosystem. So uh, our out-of-tree modules and applications are still exploding. Uh, we see this stuff, I, I don't know why this is, but people using Gunner Radio and doing amazing things with it still don't tell us that they're gonna like go keynote a conference and demo Gunner Radio, because like, we would publicize that. Um, but we see really, really neat stuff happening, especially with like GR satellites, for example, uh, which includes decoders for tons and tons of um, satellite communication systems, uh, lots of new cybersecurity work. Um, and those, some of these are both intentional and unintentional. So by that, I mean, as an example, this is some intentional cybersecurity research. Um, so Bastian Blossel, who is an uh, officer of the project, um, has been teaching classes on uh, using Goody Radio for pen testing and cybersecurity work. So if you, one of these was at WLPC, if you look for that on Twitter, you see all kinds of cool stuff like um, people bringing down Wi-Fi systems with little SDRs and good radio. Um, so that's obviously intentional cybersecurity work. Then there's stuff like this, uh, which was announced at um, an Osmocom event, uh, Osmo FL2K, uh, which is where you can use USB VGA dongles uh, to transmit, which is really cool. Um, that part of it actually doesn't use Goon Radio. Um, the part of it that uses Goon Radio is uh, spoofing cellular base stations and GPS with a $15 dongle. Um, so that's kind of an unintentional thing. The goal wasn't to create a tool like that, uh, but it becomes immediately use, use, used for things like that. Um, another one, so BMW Connected Drive was hacked in 2015 by Dieter Spar. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. Where are the Germans in the room? I apologize. Um, it's in the news again. Uh, a group in China, I believe, redid it. Um, they talk a lot about various SDR hardware and good radio and that sort of thing. Um, I wanted to bring that up because this is not the first time that cars have been hacked. And by hacked, I don't just mean like, oh, we broke into your Bluetooth system. It's like, I can drive your car and use the pedals from a flow graph kind of thing. Um, I added these, so this image on the left of the silhouette approaching the car, that's actually from some ridiculous press that the thing got. The one on the right is just my current favor hacker stereotype image. It's especially good because 
The guy's not only wearing a hoodie, which is like the usual stereotype, right? He's typing in gloves <laughs> on three computers in the streaming matrix fake language. That's, that's pretty good. Uh, Volk and SigMF continue to grow. Um, so SigMF especially, uh, which is relatively new, just started early 2017 last year, has exploded. There'll be a workshop for that later. Um, and there's uh, some, some discussion by a, a, a government agency that's using it about pulling it into an IEEE workshop to be standardized, which is kind of crazy. So Canradio might be an IEEE standard here before too long. Okay, uh, community update, GQRX. Who uses GQRX? Lots of people. It is no longer being maintained. The last release was in May of this year. Uh, it's been it was created and maintained by Alexandru, I'm not gonna pronounce, Sest, Seest? Sorry, Alexandru. Um, but uh, he's decided to move on. He's actually been working on other projects for quite a while. Um, it became really time intensive for him to maintain this. Uh, GTRX looks really nice. It's a fantastic demo, and lots and lots of people like using it with their hardware. And uh, maintaining or integrating support for new hardware systems became too time intensive for him, and he wanted to work on something else. So he is looking for an adopter. Uh, he's willing to hand the project over to, to a new maintainer if you're up for taking it on. Um, so if you are, come talk to me, and I can put you in touch with Alexandru. So this is actually kind of a good lead-in to the rest of my presentation, uh, which is about the sustainability of GNU Radio. Um, this is kind of an example, right, of a GNU Radio maintainer who's sort of shouldered this project entirely on his own for five years, saying, you know, whether it's I'm tired of doing it or I just want to do something else, even though I still like it, right, walking, walking away. So what, what happens, right? What happens in GQRX? And are projects like this ultimately sustainable? So the concept of, if you search for sustainable open source, uh, it's a very hot topic right now. There's actually a lot of startups, by a lot, I mean like maybe a half dozen, uh, that are trying to address this problem. Uh, there's one called Code Fund that has a system where it's basically an ad network, and developers that go to your project's repository page and your website will be served ads and that's supposed to help fund the project. There's another one called Tidelift, which is um, sort of wrapping, wrapping projects in professional services and promising that, like, hey, if you use a Tidelift project, um, we guarantee like, all the licenses are good and you know, we're regularly running security checks for you and that sort of thing. And, as, and then they take your subscription money and pay the developers. So there's lots of startups that are trying different models here. Um, but ultimately, they're all trying to solve the same problem of how how do we actually make large projects sustainable? Because what, what happens is when a project is small, it's relatively easy to maintain, even by one or a handful of people. Um, once it grows and starts getting used for more and more things, simply answering emails or responding to GitHub issues can become a really significant burden, especially if you're not being paid for it. Um, so there's lots of things that are underway, right? There's different business models that are being tried, foundations, grants, corporate support. This is probably part of the reason I asked that question during our keynote talk. Um, but none of them are easy, right? So uh, as an example, the foundation, foundation one, um, to really run a nonprofit foundation, that takes significant administrative time, uh, like really one to two full-time employees for a project as large as Green Radio. Um, business models, there's a lot of open source maintainers who just want to create awesome stuff. They don't want to have to worry about uh, marketing and accounting and adhering to you know, whatever export laws are applicable to them. They just want to work on code. Um, so who takes on that work and where does the money come from? Um, this, is a really, this remains a really serious problem. Um, and radio has been fortunate in that a lot of our development has been funded by uh, companies or even outside grants. I'll talk about that a little bit more. But as another example of this, um, who here is, has ever used Octave or is an Octave user? Yeah, okay. Did you guys know that last year he 
was begging for money because he had emptied his savings account, paying for his livelihood because nobody was paying him for Octave. Um, this is a much longer email. It goes on for a while, but the gist of it was no, he was not making any money paying, developing Octave, so he said, I'm, I've emptied my savings. Either somebody finds, find, please find a way to get me money or I have to go on to something else. Um, so Octave is a really large project, right? But it's not just a problem for large projects. Here's an example of uh, an Emacs developer, bless his heart. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, that one was for you, Matt. <laughs> uh, so he develops, this is the lead maintainer of org mode. He didn't have enough money to buy himself a new laptop. He was asking for people to PayPal him money to buy a new laptop, right? So it's large and small projects alike. Um, so uh, the thing nowadays, right, is you know how, some, how much somebody cares about it by how much they tweet about it. I tweet about this a lot, so that's how you know I care. <laughs> uh, so Gunner Radio was founded with $320,000 donation for development. Thank you, John Gilmore. Um, since then, uh, you know, it's really been funded by companies like Edis Research, who hire core developers out of the Gun Radio community and allow them to use company time to pay for it. Uh, academics, who are able to work Gun Radio development into their academic research, uh, or that kind of thing. Um, but realistically, many, many, many millions of dollars are spent using Gun Radio and developing Gun Radio, developing applications using Gun Radio every year. And very, very little is actually in Gun Radio itself. Um, just like some ways to think about this, right? Like every time. Marcus Mueller responds to you on the mailing list with what ef would effectively constitute a master's thesis, law tech equations and all, at most universities, um, explaining the theory of communications and why what you did is not working to you, how much is that worth? Like how much would you have paid a consultant to do that for you? Um, what about tutorials and blogs and video examples? Like, would you pay $5 for a working satellite decoder modem? $10, $100? Right? How much would a commercial company charge for that? Um, more importantly, if Green Radio disappeared overnight, this is kind of the heads up question, if Green Radio disappeared tonight, how much would you pay to bring it back? How much would, Green Radio runs a lot of satellite ground station networks, not just SatNogs, a lot of commercial networks. How much do you think those commercial ground station operators would pay to bring Green Radio back? I would bet a lot. Um, so, Goal here isn't to shame anybody. I'm just raising a topic. We're not in panic mode. Um, we're doing fine right now, but this is something we need to be thinking about because as Green Radio continues to grow and get more mature and the work becomes more complex, we really need a way to make this sustainable, right? And I do want to make it clear that um, this isn't really just this isn't just me like yelling at you guys. Hey, you guys need to be giving Green Radio money or contributing code or paying your employees to be active in the community. It's on us as Green Radio leadership and developers to figure out how to make this work, right? If you come to me and you're like, hey, I have $1,000 to give you to help fund development, I'm like, that's great, I have no way to accept that. That's, that's a problem, right? Like, there has to be a model here that works for everybody, and so there's a lot of work for us to do, and uh, I mostly just wanna make everybody that's paying attention aware that this is something that we have to figure out. Um, so if you have ideas, if you have feedback on what we could be doing, ways that you think you could contribute that you're not, um, you know, come talk to me about it. Um, like I said, we're, this is not a fire right now. We're not in panic mode, but we want to solve the problem before it becomes a fire, right? So if you're thinking about it, if you're worried about it, um, you know, come chat with me about it. And even if you just have ideas, uh, that would be good. So of our core development team, this is where we are right now. Six are employed by private industry. Half of those are by Edis. Two are by two, I think. Um, or no, two, two are from DeepSig. One is from, um, I'm sorry, I lost track of, it was, it was Bell, and then it was Telcordia, and then it was ACS, and then it was Vespa, and now it's Perspecta, I think, or something. Anyways, there's a company, uh, <laughs> Mark, it's, I think it's Perspecta now, right? It's kind of like the Maycom Tyco Cobham disaster from 10 years ago. Okay, uh, we have two employed in academia. One is a student, one is self-employed as a consultant, and one is at a federally funded research lab. And this is just the core development team, not even speaking about packagers. Um, so eventually we will require 
paid work to maintain position utility. And what I mean by paid work is uh, not just companies paying their employees to work on Green Radio, because A, the companies could decide, hey, we have a product release next month that's more important than making this commit to Green Radio, and that hurts the whole community, unfortunately, right? So we can't, we can't rely on that. And secondly, if that person decides they need to move geographically or they want a new job, right, that company has not only lost a Green Radio knowledgeable employee, but we've now lost the developer if they go to a company that won't fund that effort. Um, so we need to become more independent. So we have the Green Radio Foundation, but not steady income. And what I mean by that is this is what our bank account looks like every year. I drew this on some graph paper less, well, uh, months ago when I wrote this presentation. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so if anybody can see, as you guys at the edge can't see my laser pointer here, we're sort of flat up until after GRCon, so all the way on the left side here. This is meant to be the beginning of October. Um, we're flat coming out of October into the new year. We pay a bunch of money to pay for Green Radio's infrastructure costs, which basically bottoms out the account. Uh, somewhere around like June-ish, we start seeing a slow revenue bump as people start buying registrations, and we start getting sponsorship income. This giant spike here is the week before GRCon, when apparently all of you buy your tickets. Yeah, and then uh, then it craters when we actually pay for the conference, and you know the cycle starts over again. Um, so if we change nothing, if this is the way we keep going, we will sort of level out, I think and eventually become obsolete. This is many years out here, not talking about like, you know, months or even you know, next year or the year after that. Um, but long term, long term, if nothing changes, we're gonna kind of be in a holding pattern. Um, and there's a lot of hard questions to answer about what to do about that. So, this isn't meant to sound dire. Um, don't panic, we have like I said, we're okay right now. We're just trying to solve a problem that's gonna hit us in the future. Uh, we are, I think, I put arguably in there to protect myself a little bit, but we are the strongest SDR ecosystem in the world. Um, the footprint of Green Radio is huge. It's absolutely huge. Um, it's bigger than I think most people in the community even realize, right? I, even since having taken over Green Radio, I've, I've been surprised. Um, like I've, tour large companies who are like, oh yes, we spent $5 million to build this SDR lab that's just for Green Radio. I'm like, I've never heard of you. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is great. Um, but there's significant investment happening and there's a lot of activity happening and realistically we don't hear about most of it. Um, so the goal here is really just to plan for, plan for what's coming. Uh, this is the end of my presentation. So, you know, we've, in the last year here, we've seen Huge increase in activity, lots of new contributions. Um, community is really, really taking off. And you know, in my talk last year, I, I talked a little bit about how the community itself had started to broaden, right? Like, most people are not just GNU Radio users anymore, right? People use MATLAB and GNU Radio, or they use uh, like Red Hawk and OpenCPI and GNU Radio, or they use something like Liquid DSP and GNU Radio. Um, most people are not Green Radio purists. Uh, and I think what we've started to see here is Green Radio has reached the point where you don't even really have to be a radio developer. Uh, I think a lot of the reason why we don't see a lot of the activity that happens is that a non-insignificant portion of the community now aren't radio people. They, don't, they have no idea how to, how to design DSP algorithms or how to build modems. That's not what they're doing. They're, they're interested in, they're, it's a cybersecurity researcher. Right, who has realized if, you know, if they grab a low-cost SDR and they pull some reference examples and can read it that somebody else built, they can you know, investigate a Wi-Fi network right, without really understanding the DSP concepts behind it. So we've really started to see, this, see the project and community expand beyond, uh, I think, what we had considered uh, uh, you know, the, the core of the core of the demographic. Um, so going forward, you know, we need to be thinking about, we have a lot of activity in the, in the core of the project now. Um, things are moving along very well. So it's time to start thinking about how we keep that going, right? 
Once 3.8 once 3 comes out, how do we get to 3.9 or 4, or 4.0, right? How do we make that next, how do we make that next big leap? Um, I don't think that the current model would, would support it. So the question is, how, how do we get there? So if you want to get involved, contribute, just chat. Um, please do. You can find me or any other core contributor. Uh, and I'm happy to take questions from anyone that has them. You know, OK, sure, you can clap. Yeah, thanks. Is the break after this? Or is it, no, is it my talk? Oh, OK, yeah. Um, is, is Mark here? You should get lobbed. Yeah. So I have a question for you. Um, you've considered cyber, uh, new radio as a platform for um, conducting cybersecurity. Have you considered it as a target of uh, cybersecurity attacks? Uh, there have been several Git, uh, you know, well-publicized Git uh, breaches, and I'm wondering uh, if you have policies in place to help uh, support your own security. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. Um, and the answer is that I think this is not handled, we're not doing this very well right now. Um, so, I mean, Gun Radio does go through, all of the core code goes through static code analysis, um, which does a fairly good job of, like, your, this buffer is not protected, right? Or you're not, you're not sanitizing input, that sort of thing. Um, but, I mean, nobody, as far as I'm aware, is fuzzing GNU Radio, right? I, th I think Seth Heightfield had a paper doing something similar. To, Sorry? I think Seth Heightfield had a paper where he did something, I don't know if it was fuzzing, but he had some attack on STRs. Yeah, I think he, so Seth Heightfield is a, um, actually not sure, he might have graduated. He was a graduate student at the Virginia Tech Hume Center. He, pre he presented on exactly this topic uh, last year, I think. Or was that the last year or the year before? Uh, about exploiting the software running in an SDR to basically take control of the radio unit. Um, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, 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 sorry. I totally misunderstood your question. Um, yeah, so uh, I mean, our infrastructure is run by, heavily by Andre, uh, and, and now Nate is getting more involved. Um, yeah, and I mean, that's fairly, we, we use a mix of outside services to host things. Like, obviously, we're not thinking about what happens if GitHub gets DDoSed. We're hoping GitHub is thinking about what, what happens if GitHub gets DDoSed. Um, for the services that we do host ourselves, uh, Andre, do you want to? Were you standing up because you wanted to respond, or because we're getting DDoS? <laughs> no. Okay. Yeah. Anyways. Um, yeah. No. That's. I mean, that's something that we're expending effort on ourselves. Um, other than we did have a website instant in, incident. Uh, what was that? Three or four months ago, when the WordPress instance that we had got breached. So yeah, that was like half a year ago, I think. And yeah. So the, so that I'm. Um, that we do have like security problems like every other operator of websites does. We do have like a spam problem in the wiki and so on and so on. And we're actively countering that. But that's like not special to any project, right? So the question here is like the code tooling and how, how do we ensure integrity of the source basically. So that's, um, so first of all, of course, we have like human code review. There's no, not a single line of code that makes it into a tree without like me reading it, um, which, I mean, don't bribe me. Um, uh, so, so um, yeah, that's, that's basically our main defense um, is, is the human factor there. But we do have like a large legacy code base. It's, it's not a small project by any means anymore. So, um, I know a lot of places where I, I'd like to see more like bounce checking, like the usual like buffer overflow research made easy could happen in Green Radio. I, I've not, I'm not aware of any case where actually anyone like demonstrated that it can be executed, like our, like code execution could happen remotely. So over I think he's he's talking about the actual like web infrastructure. Yeah. So I think I think the short story, the short the short the short answer to your question is. We have had incidents in the past, um, like the WordPress breach. Uh, we do do a lot ourselves right now to try to save money that might increase in the future. Uh, we're doing the best we can, um, but realistically, there's, there are probably vulnerabilities that we don't know about. Yeah. 
Um, just to add in, a lot of the, you mentioned like Git vulnerabilities and other projects. I think a lot of that comes from people checking in secret keys and more web app type things. And I don't think that we have that type of secret key that could accidentally take over the web app because there is no web app. Um, so I've been thinking about a couple of Git projects in which password reuse or password pattern use hmm. um, allowed for a password that was hacked from a developer in one social media site to be used against a Git um, account. So oh. the policies that I'm thinking about are the ones that you encourage your developers for secure practice. Right, okay, I understand. I think I misunderstood your question twice. And, and I apologize for yeah, not no, making it clear. It's probably not your fault. No, absolutely. So just to clarify for anyone uh, who's curious, um, and again, clarify for me if I misstate this, your question is basically, how do we make sure that the code we are distributing in GNU Radio has not been compromised by an attacker? Right, so how do we make sure that an attacker has not inserted a vulnerability into the Radio code base, I think it's distributed to all of our users, right? Um, so we do, have, we do have mitigations and steps against that. Uh, we have our signing policies are relatively strict. Um, when the Radio PGP keys were handed from Jonathan Corgan to Nathan West a couple of years ago, it was, it, was, it required bo both of them to travel to the same location physically, uh, write down a series of long PGP keys on hand, recopy it over, and it was like USB drives could not be plugged into the computer. Uh, it, it, I mean, it felt over the top, but uh, there is a lot of thought that goes into that. Um, and because realistically, we, we do know that Gun Radio makes it into a, it, it goes everywhere, right? It goes everywhere. Um, from you know, people's personal laptops to, again, satellite ground stations. Uh, so we do have a lot of, we do think about that. Um, I, I am much less concerned about that, knowing the processes that we have, than I am about somebody hacking the website. Yeah. Uh, other questions? How much, uh, go ahead, Sam, Richard. Uh, how much time do I have, Derek? Okay. So. One minute? Okay. Oh, okay. Okay, so given that, um, I know this isn't a solution, like total solution, but besides time and effort, is there a reason that there's kind of no donation uh, process for kind of just everyday users? I mean, no donation got, process? Yeah, if we have like, mm -hmm. you know, most of the people who use GNU Radio donate a dollar or five dollars, yep. I think that'd be a significant amount. Yeah, so we had, um, for years actually, we had a donate PayPal button on the GNU Radio website. I don't know, we might have made 20 bucks or something. Um, Martin, go ahead. Yeah, so what Martin was saying is that we did have a PayPal donation button on the website. It wasn't used all that well, but money did come into it occasionally. When we migrated away from Redmine a couple of years ago, we sort of accidentally dropped it, and it never generated enough money to make us really think about it. Realistically, we should have that there, though. Um, I mean, even a little bit of money helps, right? So yeah, we did forget. We, that is currently missing. We dropped it. Any other questions? Nope. Okay, awesome. Thank you very much.